Hello, everyone. My name is Carlos Aguilar. Uh, I'm a film critic here in Los Angeles, and it's my pleasure to moderate this conversation uh, on the 10th anniversary of A Better Life. And uh, thank you to LTX Quest and to LACO Lab for hosting this conversation. Uh, it's my pleasure to have the director of the film, Chris White, here, and the star of the film, Demian Bichir. Thank you for joining us, guys. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, so, you know, it's 10 years, which is it's pretty amazing that it's been so long and it's been a very eventful 10 years, you know, just, you know, looking back at, you know, what's happened since the release of the film, you know, uh, back in 2011, when the film came out, um, DACA, uh, the fur action hadn't happened, uh, the 2016 election hadn't happened, you know, and all that came with that. Um, so sort of we're like in a very different moment from from 10 years ago. And I wanted to start by asking you, both of you, whoever wants to go first, um, you know, when you look back, uh, you know, uh, 10 years ago, what were sort of those conversations or the, the sense that you get that, that that was happening in terms of immigration, in terms of Latino representation? You know, I feel like in these 10 years, we've also, you know, the conversations on representation and, and diversity and inclusion and entertainment and in all other sectors has definitely uh, shifted. Oh, I can jump in. I mean, I, I you know, I remember uh, speaking to Eric Eason, the writer of the movie, uh, and he, when we were about to start shooting, and uh, and he was very nervous. He said, "Look, um, we've got to get this film out quickly because the the issue may be over by the time the film comes out." <laughs> and I said, "I said I don't think we need to worry about that, but that would be a good problem to have." I mean, I think unfortunately, in the last ten years, we haven't seen things get much better at all in spite of the um, the best efforts of, of many parties. I think we've, we've seen all kinds of um, new acts of uh, cruelty and ignorance and, um, and meanness. Um, that's not to say that, that people aren't sort of becoming more aware of, uh, of the issue, which, which is a good thing. And that DACA seems to be, you know, holding up in this fight, which, which is great. But I think it's still a, a tough scenario. I mean, I think the, the question of sort of Latino representation is that there, we, we, we're probably seeing more of it. Um, but I think also we're seeing, uh, you know, these kind of um, issues to do with whether the, um, you know, so first I want to say, like, I, I, I can pass as white, right? My grandma was Mexican. My, my mother's first language was Spanish. But in many ways, I'm talking slightly with one foot in, one foot out of this, of this question. But I also think that we still have a problem in terms of films that are directed towards um, Latino, Latinx audiences of, of whether people are actually going to show up in the way that um, other communities come and support their films. Where were you, Damien, 10 years ago when, when this film came your way? I was lost in the world until Chris Weiss found me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it, was a, it was a beautiful love story. <laughs> it was a beautiful love story, <laughs> totally. Uh, I was I was um, actually coming from Mexico, from uh, uh, shooting a, a film about Miguel Hidalgo, the father of the Mexican independence, and uh, I, I had shaved my head, and uh, and it was when uh, Chris Weiss wanted me to. Uh, uh, do the auditions for, you know, the different studios that were producing A Better Life. Chris Weiss wanted me to play that role, uh, but he also told me we want to convince about 15 more people. And, uh, <laughs> I, and I thought, yeah, let's do that. You know, that's, that's pretty much what I've, I've done all my life, you know, uh, really, really fight. Uh, uh, tough for whatever I want, and uh, and I couldn't let Chris down. You know, um, he put everything on my name, uh, an absolute unknown name, uh, and we won. Um, I, I, and as uh, as Chris says, you know, I I've been around. I've been an Angelino for pff, more than half my life. You know, I I moved to Los Angeles after New York when I was only 25. And, uh, you know, I kept trying and trying and trying and nothing was happening until I met the great Amy Brownstein. And, uh, uh, but that was many years later. Uh, I had just came back to, to Los Angeles and nothing had really changed 
from the times that I was here, you know, in 18, 19, yeah, sorry, 1989, 90. And, uh, and I felt the same hostility and the same uh, uh, lack of representation of, uh, you know, not only Mexicans in, in Hollywood, but also Latin America in general. I remember it was it was uh, barely the time where you know a few things were being done here and there. Salma Hayek was you know struggling to break through, and uh, um, she had made a film called La Vida Loca. Uh, I remember we briefly met around that time, and uh, there was nothing. You know, it, it was only Alfonso Arau doing like Water for Chocolate. And uh, Luis Mandoki doing uh, a, a couple of uh, films, but very, very much, you know, like um, full American productions, but not really into uh, any Latin matter, any Latin subject matter. And, um, and to me, the biggest surprise after we did, because when I read the script of A Better Life, I, I, I told Chris, okay, just send me the list of the people I need to annihilate, you know, like, like exterminate from, <laughs> from the face of the earth. Because I want this role. This this has to be mine. And everybody who's everybody in the Hispanic, uh, you know, acting world in, in, in the U.S., they wanted that role. It's, it's just one of those beautiful, beautiful, juicy, fantastic, overwhelming pieces of uh, work for any actor that anyone would, you know, kill to play. And um, and I was lucky to have this man, you know, put in everything he had on my name. And uh, and I remember that once we when we completed the film, I was really, really hopeful to have everybody, the, the whole Hispanic community, Latin American community, not only Mexicans, not, not only uh, you know, undocumented workers, but but everybody, you know, 32 million people would come and see this film. That was my dream. That was my hope. And it was very heartbreaking and disappointing to find out that no one came to see it. We lost the battle at the box office when we opened the film. And it was only later on, you know, on airplanes and platforms and, uh, you know, I, I think Netflix was like in diapers, right? It was like a, just mm -hmm. beginning to happen. And uh, it was like in rental and uh, buying the film later on that they picked up a lot. And uh, a lot of people, you know, watched it later on. But none of my fellow countrymen and women, women and men, have seen the film. Not all the, the you know, all my buddies, all the, 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 the waitresses, the, the waiters that I know, all the uh, par ballet parking guys, all the, you know, uh, nannies that I know, everybody who says hi to you in the street, you know, like, hey, the man, or when, when I go to the stadium and, uh, you know, I thought these guys would come and see our film. But, and that's a really interesting phenomenon because, um, yeah, and that's something that we discussed many times when we were promoting the film. We were going, they were targeting the promotion and the interviews and all that into all the Hispanic, you know, market. And I thought my paisanos, they don't, they don't have time to go to the movies, you know, really. And yeah. when they go, they, they, they just want to, they want to escape from reality. They want to, you know, see something else. And they probably go and see Transformers and this and that and whatever, right? And, um, and it was later on that they saw the film. You know, all, all my fellow country women and men. They, they, they began talking about it, but it was right at the box office where we needed them to come and win that battle. Because that's the only way you can tell Hollywood that these films are needed, that these films are good, that people will come and see them. Because yeah, that's I, pretty yeah. much the way it works, you know. I, I, think, I think, Damian, like what you say is so right. I mean, it, life is hard, right, for a lot of the people who are sort of portrayed in the film. You know, w whether they're going to go and, and see a film that sort of addresses the kind of struggles that they go through is, you know, I, I, I can't I can't blame people. Right. I mean, now, now, 10 years later, like if this film came out on Netflix, which is what it would probably do, man, it might be a different story. And I think, you know, Demian's a bit modest because it was also the quality of his performance that eventually kind of raised this out of sort of, the, you know, it not doing particularly well at the box office, but being this kind of tremendous sort of prestige, like 
like nobody saw us coming when it came to the Oscars, right? And Demian gets nominated. And to this day, I think my guy should have won. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, I know it, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm with you, man. <laughs> with, with, with all this this in mind you know chris when you first you know you were coming off of like very sort of big projects before this film you know sort of the opposite end of, of the industry the you know the blockbusters that were sort of like you know meant to do well the box office mm. why did you decide to to take a chance and like i don't want to say downgrade but like sort of like come down to the indie level and say you know i already had success in these big films but i want to make something you know, perhaps because it mattered? Was it sort of like a social responsibility you felt to make this film? No, I mean, that wasn't where it was coming from. I, it was actually, uh, you know, uh, it was the best script that I had read um, that had ever been sent to me, frankly. You know, I mean, I write my own stuff sometimes, but it's much easier when somebody does it for you. And like, <laughs> this thing was amazing. Uh, and um, and I, I try to like uh, uh, change things up. So I just directed a film about the dilemma of what happens when you're in love with a vampire and uh, a werewolf also wants to be your boyfriend, you know? So like <laughs> that kind of movie is good and it needs to be out there. Um, but then there are other kinds of films to do too. And after you direct a film about a lot of CG and all this kind of stuff happening, it's, you know, my ideal film is a bunch of people sitting and talking to each other. Um, and credit where credit is due to the guys who made the vampire movie, um, they helped fund this movie. And they were just like, mm -hmm. yeah, great. We love this script too. Um, so I don't think, um, I mean, much as we can say, like, uh, like people don't want to take their medicine, right, when they go to the movies. I also, like, don't want to do something medicinal for the, for the purpose of it just because of, like, you know, social uh, value or something. It was, it really felt to me like a beautiful story that I could sort of tell. Um, and, and also there's, you know, my, you know, my, my, my grandma came to this country when she was 17. She never changed her nationality. Um, she was Mexican, so the day she died at age 106. Um, and so, uh, you know, I've been lucky sometimes in, in the movies that I've been able to make and sort of being able to think about different parts of my, my past and my family. So there was that too. Totally. Damien, when you were approaching Carlos, that is, you know, a character that's an immigrant that has a very, you know, specific experience, he's undocumented, and he has a son, he doesn't have a, a mother to help him, and he's trying to work and do, you know, sort of the best for his child. How do you even, you know, begin to sort of grapple and, you know, like sort of address that, that kind of character? It was, it was part of the beauty of it. It was part of the challenge to step into this, you know, character's bones and flesh and uh, psyche and emotions and... Uh, It was so beautifully written, and uh, and I it, a, a full exploration of uh, uh, this type of uh, human beings, you know, began at that point, and uh, I would stop every time I would see, you know, any gardener's truck anywhere. I would stop and uh, talk to the guys, you know, a little more, and uh, go deep into their own, you know, daily lives and problems and this and that, and. Uh, And then, you know, there's a, 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 a big uh, part of uh, my own story that I applied to it, too. You know, uh, I have wonderful parents. I, I have wonderful parents. And uh, both are, you know, like like mother and a father within themselves. You know, they're both beautiful. And uh, so I took a lot from that. And uh, um And, and, and then physically, you know, the physicality of it, that, that was also a, an interesting challenge. Uh, I had come from playing Fidel Castro with Steven Soderbergh, with, where I had gained about 25, 30 pounds or so to play Fidel. And then it took me a year to lose the, the weight. And then Chris said, I think you should be heavier for that role, for this role. And I said, shit, damn it. Okay, let's go up again. I won't do it again because I'm 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 too old now. But uh, so we went up again, and uh, and it was it was really interesting to you know play along with the whole thing and the uh, and how to actually do a garden, you know, and uh, but but it was more like in the emotional side of it, you know, how to to become a mother more than a father, you know. I that that was that was that was a very interesting type of twist for me to uh, explore. Totally. You know, uh, Chris, in, in your conversations with, with Eric, the, string, the screenwriter, um, did you discuss sort of like where did the authenticity come from? Like, how do you ensure that you're depicting these type of characters and this existing in a way 
that is, you know, faithful, uh, you know, to these people? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I knew that Demian was going to do his thing and inhabit that that character. I wasn't really worried about that aspect of it. There are other aspects of, of East Los Angeles that I really wanted to, to get right, or at least not to get wrong, right? Um, and so I'm a complete research nerds I'm, I'm i'm a bookworm right so i started reading and reading which isn't enough but but in the, in the process of uh, reading these books there was a guy that they kept on referring to when they talked about gangs because yeah you know the, the gangs in east l.a are, are play, play a sort of a, a big role in this um and um so i met this guy father gregory boyle who um runs who started homeboy industries right which is a gang uh intervention uh program the biggest one in the world and I sent him the, the script and I said, could I come and talk to you? And, uh, and I listened to, to what he had to say about East Los Angeles, about Boyle Heights, which is where we ended up shooting a lot of this. Um, you know, and also I knew, so, so, and actually if you see sort of uh, characters who are playing gang members in the movie, they were generally cast out of homeboy industries, right? We did, a, we did an open call basically. And amazingly, Richard Cabral, who plays the sort of most prominent gang member in this movie, is is twice Emmy nominated now, right? He's on um, Mayans um, uh, MC, and he was nominated for American Crime Story. And he's you know he's a fantastic guy and an artist, but he came out of of, of that world. Um, and uh, it was also important to me that we have a a bilingual crew, right? So that. That, that all along the way, in theory, hopefully there are a number of flags that can go up when you're getting things wrong. Now that's not to say I, I think I got everything right, but we we try to ensure that you know even though I'm not from that neighborhood, uh, I'm not from that background, that we are having people who can kind of inform us as it goes along. Totally. Uh, and in that sense, how did you find or what was the casting like for Jose Julian? And, you know, he, it was sort of like his first, you know, entry yeah. way into the film industry now with a sort of like a career with a lot of titles now. But, you know, I feel like yeah. that was the breakthrough for him. You just hope you get lucky, you know, like um, sometimes with some roles in some movies, you think, well, I could I could have this guy or that guy or, or this this actress or that actress. You know, we, we, I, I was, but I, I tend to kind of fall in love sometimes. So I kind of staked my claim on, on Demian. And if things hadn't worked out that way, I'm not sure I would have wanted to make the movie. So he was the key piece, right? But then you're thinking, oh, the kid. Um, and uh, you just have to keep on seeing person after person until something, until something feels, feels right. Um, and you hope, you hope you're not stuck with, you know, just going with the best you could get, but with somebody who actually feels like they, they really belong. Um, and Jose is like a really kind of idiosyncratic, uh, interesting, uh, uh, smart kid who uh, who worked well with Demian. Like they had their own kind of relationship going. And, and even though he was uh, kind of early in his career, uh, you know, Demian was kind of able to be his kind of mentor in terms of how to how to do these things, right? Because um, it's tricky, uh, not especially as a, as a as a younger actor, not trying to overplay things. Um, so, you know, you just hope you get lucky over and over again, but, the, but the, the film was kind of marked by some, some really bits of good fortune, you know, like when we go to the Chariada, you know, we, we were lucky enough to sort of have the, um, contribution of the, the local kind of charros there and to be able to shoot in Pico Rivera, you know, it's like, we, we dreamed of kind of shooting something that had this sort of sense of the old country in Los Angeles. And of course there's this amazing, uh, uh, Mexican rodeo ring outside of Los Angeles. And, um, you know, there happened to be a demonstration, uh, an immigration uh, demonstration just as we were shooting. And we thought, well, can we do this? We can, can we go around in a bus and shoot on the fly? And so when you see those, those scenes, you know, we would never have been able to mount those kinds of, um, those kinds of extra uh, uh, scenes, but, but we, we just got lucky. You just hope to get lucky over and over again. Totally. Demian, can you speak to that relationship with, with Jose on set and, and, you know, very emotional moments that you have with him? Um, it, was, it was, I mean, whenever you work on a film, you create, you know, very, very tight uh, affections. And, uh, and especially when you have children in the story. But most, more, more specifically, in this type of uh, case, this is the first time that I, that I make a film with where my protagonist is, is a kid, you know, my son. So 
it was it was uh, it was crucial to have uh, bonding, um, and we we were lucky because we we liked each other from day one, and uh, he was always you know he's like sponge you know he was always like like uh, just tell me tell me tell me tell me I want to learn I want to learn, and uh, he was always very you know open and uh, receptive, and uh, and we spent a lot of time together. You know, uh, playing along. You know, I would pick him up and uh, just hang out and uh, spend some time together. And then during the shooting, we we're fully together the whole time. You know, not only because of the scenes we had to do, but uh, but because you know we became good friends. And uh, I, this, it was really really difficult to make a film. You know, and uh, to to carry the the weight of a protagonist in a film especially for a kid and especially if it's your first time, you know, and he was, he was, he was a rock. He was, he was tough and he was, uh, hmm, he was there, you know, he, he never, never, he didn't know any times off, you know, he was, he was really, really there. His discipline and his, you know, determination was, was very inspiring. And, uh, and 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 there were some you know really really powerful scenes that we had together, but those scenes were floating you know somehow because we were very very lucky the way Chris planned the whole shooting was almost chronologically mm-hmm. that so that we were building the story of of the characters together day by day so by the time we reached you know those very emotional scenes. We were already there, you know, not only Julian and I as an actor, as actors, but the rest of the crew, we were all so much in touch with the characters. We were so close to whatever they were living that we were, it, it was, I remember, you know, I'm getting me a goosebumps now because I remember toward the end of the shooting, the last two weeks, we were all very, very, you know, emotional. It was, it was a beautiful shoot. Um. Chris, going back to a little bit of what you were saying about, you know, um, La Charreada and Pico Rivera and Boyle Heights, you know, I feel like oftentimes, you know, when we see the pictures of Los Angeles, you know, they're not these type of places where you don't see the L.A. where, you know, Latinos live or, you know, people that, you know, that work the the ones that work in Beverly Hills don't live in Beverly Hills. So they live in other areas of the city that we never get to see. And I feel like that really provides a, an interesting mm. element to the film. Uh, talk a little bit about, you know, these locations, finding them and choosing to shoot them. Yeah, well, I think um, I, I'm really glad you feel that. Uh, I do feel that this is, you know, LA is a world of these kind of bubble cities where you're not aware of an entire life. I mean, so LA is 50% Spanish speaking, right? So, uh, but you wouldn't know that if you just hung out in the kind of um, Anglo sort of areas of LA. Uh, and there are all these amazing worlds that you can get into if you're careful and if you're respectful and if you're thoughtful enough about it. Um, and, uh, you know, I think like the, the, the opening of the movie is you're sort of setting this, the travel from, from West to East Los Angeles, right? And we were really ripping off Javier Aguirre-Sarobe, right? The, the DP said, well, in, in, um, in uh, uh, El Mar al Dentro, we, we, uh, we did this kind of transition shot where you see, the, uh, you know, Javier Bradem's character looking out the window and we see these vignettes. And so, yeah, we constructed these vignettes which followed us from west to east. And we, and also pointing out other sort of ethnic um, worlds as well. There's a part in Koreatown, you know. And, um, and so we, we, we wanted to sort of carry us over to, to, to this part of the city. Um, and then it was really about um, trying to, to poke our fingers into these, these locations and, um, and to do so with the sense that um, we were going to kind of cooperate with the people in the neighborhood that if we were shooting and in, in kind of um, you know in, in, a, in a housing project that it was not going to be one of these kind of locked up situations where you got a bunch of palookas who are keeping people from coming on set like I remember shooting in, in Boyle Heights right on a housing project and uh, everyone was just kind of wandering in and out and in part because it was a bilingual crew and nobody felt like here were the, the, the like white folks come to, to make a movie about gangs and stuff and um, and I actually I remember a, a lady who was looking at at one of the characters who had a kind of a, a like a monitor bracelet on him because it's a gang character and she uh, gave me the business she she in, in Spanish said you know what, what what are you doing come to this neighborhood kind of making a movie about about gangs and I said look let me try to explain what this story is to you right and and I I told her 
And she said, well, we'll see. Um, right. So <laughs> she, she, she lowered her objections. But then I also remember a kid who's like, he, a kid came up to me and he said, here, I want to show you something. And, um, and, and this little guy is about six years old, came in and then he took me by the hand into his apartment. And then there were his parents and I'm not sure they knew who I was. And I said, hi. And so he said, here, come, come look at this. And, and he took me to his room and there was a goldfish bowl. And he said, that's my fish. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it wasn't like, oh, let me show you like, you know, my culture. Blah, blah, blah. It's just like, here, I'm a person. I got a fish, you know. Right. And I was like, so that that's the way that you need to enter into these neighborhoods with as much, if not too much research into sort of what what's the nature of the place? Like, how can you how can you speak people's languages? How can you sort of uh, come in with adequate respect? Right. And then it's, it's a question of like, OK, so how do you make contact? If you see Pico Rivera, wow, that's a really cool location. Yeah, but we're supposed to have all of these these charros. Well, um, we got to go to a rodeo and meet the head of the Chariada um, Foundation and, and talk to them and see if they'd be willing to do this. And it turns out, yay, they're really, you know, they're, they're into the idea of showing their part of the culture. And sort of it, it, it's, it's just like digging, digging and digging and not thinking that you're going to impose your kind of view of things on them. Totally. Um, there's in, in that in that location specifically, there is, you know, a scene that I think is very powerful and important to the film, you know, where, you know, Demian's character and, and Jose Julian's character have a conversation about culture and sort of the yeah. the young the young guy's sort of detachment from from where he comes from or the roots of his, his parents' uh, homeland. Um, and I wanted to ask you guys about that, about sort of including or, or sort of dealing with that sort of loss of loss of culture or the yeah. rejection of, of who of who one is. Yeah, well, it's a very sad scene, I think. I mean, on the one hand, it's very, uh, there, there's something quite quite um, positive and full of pride about it. But the scene is about what, what this guy has lost in coming to America. You know, uh, like, cause you could, the point of the film is not like, thank God he got out of Mexico. Oh my God, can he make it in America? It's actually, you make these tremendous sacrifices because of the, the state of the world to make life better for your children, but you, you lose something in the process. Uh, and just that sort of wistful sense on, on Demian's face uh, just says, you know, uh, volumes to me when you see it. Hmm. Yeah. Anything you want I, to add, Demian? I, I, I think, because um, I know many of those people, you know, and uh, I, I family that, uh, that came here long time ago and then cousins that they just, you know, lost the language along the line, you know. Mm. At some point you're trying to blend in quickly and as soon as possible and uh, you, you don't want to be rejected. So you, 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 you don't even speak Spanish. You just forget about it because that, that takes you somewhere else and you want to be here. And um, some, some people, you know, even might think that they're, you know, it's shameful to just, you know, speak Spanish or talk about your culture. And it's about, but there, there are many, many parents that are really strict in terms of how to pass the torch, you know, to the next generation. And they might not, you know, do it outside, but at home, they talk about it. They speak Spanish. They, they you know, keep their culture running. So it goes, you know, through the next generation. But it's, it's, it's just, a, you know, I, I think it's a beautiful thing about immigration. You know, immigration makes any country better. That's, that's a fact. It creates jobs. It creates, you know, it enhances, you know, the, 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 the country's culture. And uh, many beautiful things happen when people move from one place to another. And we're living that right now, you know, in many other places in the world, from many other places in the world. And, uh, and that's the story of this, uh, that's the history of this, you know, country. So I think it's a beautiful film for many different reasons. That's, that's obviously one of them. Totally. You know, another change that I feel has happened, you know, over the, the last few years is something that might seem small, but I think is very telling. And I wanted to get your take, uh, you guys' take on it. You know, the change that, you know, most of us have been trying or, you know, publications and everywhere to not say illegal and say undocumented and sort of how, the power of, of such of something that seems so small, but you know that 
sort of, you know, one of those digi- delegitimizes the existence of someone and the other one just acknowledges, yeah. you know, the circumstance. So um, I wonder if you if you guys were thinking about those things back then or, or, or what do you take on that? Yeah, definitely. Well, I, you know, I, I, I was corrected by a friend I made who, uh, you know, as part of this as well, when the film came out, I went to D.C. and, and um, uh, met with some people and went to the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. And I was still using the term uh, illegal. I, I wasn't, I, no, I didn't call people illegals, but I said illegal, illegal uh, immigrants, right? And, uh, and my friend corrected me. She said, we don't say that. Um, we say undocumented, nobody's illegal. And I think even well-meaning people can, um, can be a bit thoughtless uh, about how they are sort of uh, conceiving this and, and messaging this. Uh, yeah, I think that change is very important. I think language is, language is very important as well. Uh, I think it's a good change that we are starting to understand that the use of that term is itself political, a political act, right? Yeah, I think, I think words do matter. And, uh, you know, there are many, many things that we're changing precisely because of that, you know what I mean? Because there's a better way to talk about human beings and no human being is illegal. No, no human being can be illegal. And then they tell you, well, they break the law, you know, they enter the country without uh, proper documentation. Yeah, but you as a driver, you also get like a parking ticket or speed, speeding ticket. You're not called an illegal driver, you know what I mean? When, when that happens, <laughs> this is just... Uh, his nature is, is uh, very, very simple and, uh, and uh, it's a human type of uh, issue. And uh, when we change the way we talk, when we modify the, the words we use, that also helps us you know, to advance as, as, as humans, especially in a society that is so divided. Sorry. Uh, the man, the, the scene in the in the detention center, which I think it's really, you know, a scene that really, you know, has a lot of emotional uh, charge, you know, because of the speech that you give to 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 the son in in this film about the reason for having him, or you know, the you know, the seeking sort of a, a better life for him. Tell me about shooting that scene, and you know, how difficult was it? How many takes did you guys do for something like that? Um, hmm. It was, uh, it was uh, as I said before, you know, by the time we shot that scene, we had already uh, traveled this beautiful journey with these two characters. And we were also immersed in their feelings and their journey again. Uh, so I remember the mood, the, the mood in our set when we got to that location that day, it was particularly... I don't want to say heavy or dense, but it was, it was, uh, there was some sadness in the atmosphere. And I remember, you know, I usually, when I, when I get a script, I, I, I define my, my own route and I detect where, you know, certain scenes will need more, um, certain this and certain that, you know, whether it's a naked scene or a love scene or running, jumping off a bridge or, you know, uh, uh, taking a, a time by storm on your horse. I, I detect those scenes. I prepare for those scenes and I physically, mentally and emotionally, you know, create a route that I follow very, very strictly. And, um, and I knew this, this scene was, was there and it will come. And, uh, and then what, what I do is that I never think about those things, you know, I, I try not to think too much about it. And I try, you know, the emotions to take charge and to, you know, take control over it. And, uh, and I personally didn't know what, what was going to happen, really. I remember Chris and I were, were talking about it when, when I got there. That was the only day that I was wearing headphones all day long, that I wasn't talking to anybody. Um, uh, and I had a specific playlist that I did for my character. And uh, so that, that's everything I heard, you know, I listened to during those months. And because uh, that kept me connected to what we were, the story we were telling. And then I told Chris, you know, I, I really don't know what's going to happen, you know, so I would just go ahead and shoot it. 
because I, I I don't think we should rehearse this or you know if if we need to rehearse it for for the camera move or whatever so everybody is in sync and ready to go then whenever we're ready we should go for it and see what happens <laughs> and I remember we shot the first take and and uh, Chris came back from uh, the monitor with tears in his eyes and he said we got it <laughs> and I. I, I, it, it was it was really really heavy, you know. It was emotionally heavy, and then we just you know went for more takes to protect this and that, and uh, cover yeah. this and that. But um, but that was that was that. Yeah, yeah. It's very tricky with a scene like that, where like first of all, you know, you don't want to you don't want to rehearse it before the day. Or I don't want to. Some people might want to, right? Some people might want to workshop it and stuff, but. But ideally, uh, well, first of all, you want to shoot the rehearsal because God knows what have you what have you missed some really wonderful yeah. stuff, um, and what if that's the moment? And then you want to be just very very careful uh, about it. Um, I mean, I, I don't think I'm um, that uh, good at foreseeing the future, but I, I had a I had a gut feeling that if we if I did my job right. And if we shot this scene without too much interruptions or or, or problems, that that we you know this was going to be an Academy Award nomination. I think I may have joked with him. <laughs> I hope not too close to the moment. I said, "Okay, you're ready for your are you ready for your Oscar scene." Uh, actually, no. That's <laughs> it, it is a true story because when back in back in like a year before that, when we auditioned for the rest of the uh, producers, Chris had chosen three different scenes. One with my sister, another one with my best friend, and another one with my kid, and uh, and it was that precise scene that he chose for that, and and that was the last scene we auditioned, and he said, "Okay, let's do your Oscar nomination scene." <laughs> <laughs> now, way by back. the way, of course, that kind of you know that's not the most important thing in the world, right? But 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 when you think about it, the kind of exposure that a film gets. When when a uh, when a performance is honored in that way is pretty extraordinary, right? Because I, I can imagine on the day when people watching an Oscar telecast and you know Natalie Portman is talking about each of the individual performances separately and what she said was very moving and was addressed directly to them. Yeah. you know that is the message. That was the message we were going for, right? right. And so uh, there is a long tail to films now. Uh, because who knows who's going to see things in a, in a movie theater now, but they live on. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and these kinds of things become important in terms of uh, how people are going to sort of get their, their, their minds around whether they're going to see this film or not. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about that Oscar nomination and, you know, the sort of unlikeliness of, of, of those type of awards, you know, uh, seeing a film like this and recognizing the man's performance and, you know, what it meant for not only for the man, but like, you know, for Mexican actors, you know, Mexican actors being nominated in this performance portraying an undocumented immigrant and sort of like the, it felt like a, a very momentous thing for a lot of reasons. So I wonder, you know, did you, did you seriously think that it was going to happen? Did it feel like it was possible? What was that sort of process and, and how do you guys find out? <laughs> I felt like it was going to happen, you know. Uh, I, I I knew it could happen. I felt like I felt like we were good enough, uh, you know, easily. But then the rest of the stuff is like is is sort of PR. It's like getting it in front of people's eyeballs, and you think, Jesus, how am I going to do that? Well, it was playing on United Airlines for for a few months before um, before the nominations were being done, and you know, you've got this kind of limited audience, but. Sometimes they're stuck in a plane and like, oh yeah, that movie. We were the first DVD um, out that season, mm -hmm. right? So you, you know, by hook or by crook, you're going to try to get people to see your movie. And then I felt like if people see this, they're going to know. There's, there's no doubt, right? Um, and then li like I'm watching, you know, my favorite basketball team, like I'm watching the Knicks and see if they're going to get in the playoffs. I'm, I'm looking at these stupid websites devoted to who, like what, what the, the current betting is on. Oscar nominations are like, oh, we're in sixth place, which means we won't get nominated. We got to get up to five, <laughs> like, like they know what they're talking about. But, but you know, I thought, well, we we've got a shot here. We're 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 gonna get in. Um, and uh, you know, we uh, it, it also takes some commitment from from the actor to 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 be open to interviews and to you know going to these like 
uh, brunches where where you, you you talk about the film with people. Uh, and 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 Demian was doing a was doing a play in Mexico City at the time, so it was very hard on his schedule and his life to try to do all these things as well as all these things are happening. So you know credit to him too uh, for 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 being open to this. I, uh, well, yeah, but, but all that was possible because of uh, Chris, you know, he literally made it happen. You know, not only the fact that I played that role, but uh, I shot that film, but uh, the whole, you know, award season campaign, which is you know, pff, very intense. And it's about that. It's about how can we make everyone who has a vote to see this film, you know, and I think the biggest achievement is that uh, it got so much attention, you know, such small film in, in, in many ways, a film that was, you know, that, that was not a success at the box office. Um, and a subject matter that, you know, not everybody cares for. And uh, I'm an, a, an absolute un, unknown name, you know. So all that against us, or with all the odds against us, we increase. Chris, with uh, you know, made sure that we would go out there, and uh, and it was crazy. We were running, you know, from one place to another for for a few weeks. And I was, as as Chris says, I was rehearsing a play in Mexico City. I remember I went to bed with a with a fever. You know, I I I was not well, and and uh, but we we had already gotten the attention from the Independent Spirit Awards and the SAG Awards before that announcement. So we were, you know, I was only dreaming, you know, I could only dream with it. It was, it was a, it was a tough call. And, uh, and I think, I think, I think it, it speaks a lot about how we immigrants are, you know, whatever happened that day when they announced the nomination, because that's pretty much who we are, you know, just when no one really cares or when, when, when not too many people believe in, you know, the, the power of 12 million undocumented workers who make, you know, the U.S. better and happier and, you know, everyone's lives easier. Just when you don't think we have that value, boom, kaboom, in your face, you know, that's, that's to me what it meant. Right. I mean, also for you personally, you know, you've had such a long career in Mexico before this. You were not known here, but you've had, you know, a legacy career. So I'm assuming that that moment was also and just hearing your name called that must have been a searing in your memory, yeah. probably. It was it was brutal. It was very, very emotional. I, I there was this restaurant right across the theater where we were rehearsing and we would go there, you know, like every afternoon on a lunch break to have our lunch and then continue rehearsing. And the place was always packed. And I entered the place and there was a standing ovation <laughs> from the whole restaurant, you know, when they saw me entering. I never experienced anything like that. <laughs> so it was, it was really, really interesting, you know, and a lot of people, you know, were just yelling and shouting, go for it, Damien. Yeah, we're so proud of you. Bah, 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 bah. So that was that was not really only for me. You know, it was for Mexico. It was for all the undocumented workers. It was for all the, for every actor in the planet looking for a place to do what they what we love. You know, everybody who was dreaming with with a career anywhere in the planet. You know, it was it was about that. It was for everybody, not only for me. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask both of you about the man specifically, you know, do you remember any in showing the film or at festivals or events? Did you ever had any, you know, encounters with, you know, Mexican people or, or you know, Latino immigrants or anyone that, you know, that felt connected or that, you know, felt represented by this film or that thanked you for, for your performance? All the time. All the time. I still get that, you know, very often. That's my uncle's story. That's my father's story. That's my brother's story. You know, it's so beautiful and so well portrayed. You know, we love you guys for that and that things like that all the time. Totally. Uh, before we wrap, uh, I want to thank you guys for all this time. I wanted to ask both of you, you know, in, in 10 years, when we get back together for the 20th anniversary, um, what do you hope uh, has changed by then? What do you, in terms of the industry, in terms of this country, what are your hopes for, for the next 10 years of, of this film? Uh well, I hope it's not alone, you know. Um, I just saw uh, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings yesterday, right? Big Marvel film. A good percentage of it is in Mandarin. Um, when 
when we were making our movie, there was a there was a, an edgy moment where they said, well, like, some, this is about 40 percent in Spanish. We're, we're getting close to where we can't resell this to cable networks because of the, you know, the, the, the linguistic kind of characteristics of this film. Uh, I hope it's much more ordinary. I hope we will have had a, a you know, a Latinx uh, superhero movie that was huge in which nobody even wondered why there were all these uh, Mexican people or Guatemalan people or Hondurans or whomever <laughs> playing all these important roles, right? Um, and, um, and I hope uh, that, that uh, the situation for immigrants in this country will be, will be better. I hope DACA will be uh, fortified. I hope the dreamers will uh, get, their, um, get their rights as, as citizens. The man? Yeah, me too. You know, I was thinking about that. We we need our own Black Panther type of uh, you know superhero to be portrayed on the uh, on screen, and uh, man, and many many more stories. You know, many beautiful stories about you know hardworking Latinos and Latinas, or Latinx. Um, I I I see in the next ten years, or I, I I'm dreaming with seeing more names nominated and. Uh, more Oscars to, you know, Mexicans and Latin Americans and, and in general, you know, actors and, uh, and more stories that can portray us. Um, and of course, you know, hopefully, I mean, 10 years is enough time already, please, to have a, a, an immigration reform that can really be, you know, a thank you note to all these, you know, hardworking human beings who give their lives literally you know, uh, to to make everyone's lives better. So I think ten years is it's 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 a, it's a good time. It's a good margin. Thank you, for sure. Um, I mean, as a DACA recipient myself personally, I want to thank you guys for this film for putting these stories out there. Um, I want to thank LTX Quest and like Ola for hosting this conversation. And once again, thank you, Damian, and thank you, Chris. It's been a wonderful time. Thank you so thank much, you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris.